Uh, thank you, everybody, and good afternoon. And if you are all in the afternoon, good afternoon to you all. And if not, um, welcome to what part of the, whatever part of the day you are in. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share this work with you. It's something we've been working on now for really quite a long time. Um, and it's had a lot of work and a lot of um, feedback. And I think we can say now it really is quite an innovative way of doing our restoration. I've just got a little outline about uh, in front of you at the moment on the types of things which the, the sessions I'm going to take you through. I'm also going to put this into um, other international perspectives, um, which I think is really important that we really don't silo ourselves in what we do, but we work across as many areas as possible. So in front of you now, you just see an outline of uh, the, the talk. So let's just begin with some work on international connections. And of course, the IUCN is, is, very, is, is an international body, but I'd like to link that to some other international work which is happening around the globe um, in parallel. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, it's doing an amazing amount of work and IPBES for short, if you haven't heard of us. Um, but it's, uh, I, I guess the easiest way to think about it is as the sister organisation to the IPCC. So we work um, with governments around the world to do assessments, um, but particularly focused on biodiversity. <clears throat> now here we have a number of people who sit um, to give technical advice to all the governments. Um, and you'll see here at the bottom, I am actually in the group which includes America, Western Europe and the other group of countries. Um, and those of us from those, that grouping of countries, which is America, Australia, New Zealand, Europe it's, and the European regions, we are the five people who are representing or, or sitting on this body uh, to bring our knowledge to the um, IPBES community. So here we are, I've just tried to put this in perspective because often we have um, uh, many international bodies and we all think they work in silos. However, what has happened really effectively over the last few years is the IPCC, uh, sorry, the IPBES, which is sitting right at the top, and I hope you can see that on your screen, um, works with all of these bodies below. And here you can also see the IUCN. So all of these bodies are now working through IPBES and we are now making sure that the work that IPBES does cuts, cuts across um, to all these different other organisations. So here I'm just going to give you a little bit of evidence about why we need to do restoration. I mean, we are restoration people and we all know why, but there's a lot of evidence sitting in some of these IPBES reports. I'm just going to show, and I'm, I'm really going to focus this talk around uh, wetlands and rivers, um, as at the moment is one of the key focuses on our invasive species thematic group with the CEM, but it is also, has we've just had a 50 year celebration of Ramsar. So uh, one of the reports that was written, has been written by Bess and for which I was a coordinating lead author was one on land degradation and restoration. And this was released in 2000 and Eight. So this was a key finding um, about really what's happening around land degradation. And I guess this is really why we need to be thinking about restoration, but it's looking at how it affects people. And we need to be, I think, in our work on restoration, really also incorporating the, the benefits to people when we do our restoration. So here's a couple of key messages that came from that land degradation um, and restoration assessment about how land degradation affects human well-being because of the loss of biodiversity. It's reached critical levels around most parts of the world and is having a very negative impact on food and water security, health and safety. And then in 2009, it released a global assessment on the state of biodiversity and ecosystem services. And I'm just putting there here just another, just some key findings from that particularly related to wetlands and rivers, and also as we've just um, in the last few weeks celebrated 50 years of Ramsar. So <clears throat> here's a lovely picture of the area somewhere close to where I'm living at the moment. Um, but you can see these words here as to why it's critically important that we really need to start thinking about water and the waterways 
and the importance of fresh water. Another finding from that global assessment was related to land degradation, but here's some actual figures specifically related to uh, wetlands. <clears throat> Now, a key con a conclusion and a critical part of um, IPBES is working with Indigenous peoples and local communities. And I put this here because the work that we're doing in the IUCN Ecosystems and Invasive Species, Species Thematic Group is also very, very much focused on working with um, Indigenous people and local communities. <clears throat> So just for your own information, as we've all been tied down a bit by the pandemic, uh, we recently, IPES recently released a report on biodiversity pandemics and pandemics. And I was a member of the scientific steering committee for that report. Now the key finding from that is the more we lose biodiversity, the more possibility we will have pandemics. So this is really is pointing another way direction as to why we need to be restoring landscapes uh, for healthy um, and efficient biodiversity. And another matter which um, I'm not sure how you're hearing about things about climate and biodiversity in America, but I certainly know in Australia, uh, a lot of the conversation seems to be around climate and emissions. However, we've brought, as it best, we've brought together 25 key scientists from the IPCC community and the biodiversity community to develop a report to really highlight to people the significant role that biodiversity plays in reducing climate change. Uh, that report will be released in May. Um, now, here we are. One of the key findings from the IPBES um, global assessment were the, the five, four or five key drivers into why we are losing biodiversity. And you can see here of those drivers, Invasive alien species is one of the key drivers which is impacting biodiversity around the globe. So IPBES is now carrying out an invasive species assessment. It's progressing extremely well. Um, and I'm going to now work, come in to tell you about the work that we're doing. Um, and I'm a, in the leadership role, which I have with the IUCN Group Commission on Ecosystem Management Group called Ecosystems and Invasive Species. We set up the group in 2012 and we sent all the, we sent communications all around the globe uh, to anyone working on invasive species, particularly trying to look at it from a holistic manner about um, the ecosystem, not the species approach, which is often the one used, but looking at it from a holistic manner. Um, and so this is our web page and please do go there at any time if you would like to hear more about us. So you can see the, the red smiley face, that's me sitting here in Perth, Western Australia. And our membership is um, from experts from 50 countries and different cultures around the globe. So uh, when we set, started ourselves off in 2012, my focus was really to be really holistic about this topic and try to work out what our overarching goal was. And through all the feedback we had, and it was huge, um, and we developed this overarching goal. We sent it once again around the globe for anyone interested um, to, to put their input in. And this is the final thing which is driving the way we are working our ecosystem, ecosystems and invasive species thematic group. You can see it's extremely holistic. It's working from legislation, governance, policy, management, and restoration. Hence has a very strong link to this CEM group on restoration, but it's also looking around biodiversity. It's looking at health, it's looking at livelihoods, it's looking at food security, and it's working with indigenous communities. You can see that um, thinking back to the IPBES work, this really fits extremely well with IPBES, and it was being developed at the same time as IPBES was developing its invasive species assessment. And we've made sure this sits really closely to that. So that's our overarching goal. This is what we do. If we do anything to do with invasive species, this is what we're trying to achieve. Then the next thing is, well, where do we do work on invasive species? And we looked at all the gaps. A lot of work was being done on islands, but then islands only make a very small percentage of the globe. So what's happening to the rest of the planet? So we then came up with what you see in front of you. And this is really where we're focusing our work around water. Water is one of the, the one of the things, the key things, and it's just coming more and more 
to fall through the four. And I, every time I look back at this, which was written in or developed in 2013, the more and more I realize how critically correct it is because we are really starting to understand the critical importance of water. So any of the work we are doing is based around that key focus you can see in front of you and also around our overarching goal. Uh, I'd just like to put a couple of these here where we worked um, with the Commission on Ecosystem Management, our Invasive Species Thematic Group at the World Conservation Congress in Hawaii. We ran a couple of sessions, particularly working with Indigenous peoples uh, around forests and around um, to, to do with invasive species. We had some outstanding outcomes and the outcomes of these workshops went into some of the um, documentation, which was developed from that for that conference uh, for that Congress. Uh, this is really important, and it's, it sits behind. You can see the words here: "We are unwell because our country is not well." That the eagle is our indicator. If the eagle is unwell, we are unwell. And this is the focus um, for working with Indigenous people, and it's also our focus very much around maintaining biodiversity. Uh, this was a really key um, outcome from that Hawaii meeting. So now as we're moving into this year, into the UN Decade of Restoration, even more and more, I can see our overarching goal being very important. So what I'm going to do now is provide to you, excuse me, to provide to you a, a little outline of an approach we have developed, which sits around the overarching goal and the um, uh, prioritisation of, of where we do our, our work. And we're trying to work out how we can manage invasive species, but really doing it with um, restoration. So it's based around weed cover value. So remembering we're working on invasive species and the plants in this particular case, um, and weed cover, I don't know if people use the word weeds in America, but that's what we're calling them here in Western Australia. So we're really looking at the landscape and we're looking at uh, the level of weed invasion and we're developing a whole baseline data um, set on what that weed cover value is. And you can see here in um, this little spot here, the 80 to 100% weeds becomes a red area uh, all the way down to very good condition, uh, which is zero to 20% weeds in the dark green. Um, so what we're doing is setting up this first biodiversity data space and then we're incorporating to a GIS system into management and then we're bringing money into that and to come up with a, a success indicator. So what I'm going to do now is take you through um, the process that we go through to develop this. Um, this approach was did win um, a United Nations Award in 2019 for its, its success and also for the way it was working with local communities. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just gonna have a little drink of water. Um, so now I just want to show you where we are doing our work. So here's a map of Australia with our biodiversity regions or bio regions. <clears throat> so down here in this little corner of Perth in Western Australia, uh, we are doing our work. But why have we set it? Why is this a really good place to be launching or to be operating an invasive species and a restoration group from? It's because of all these different bioregions that we have. Within Western Australia, which is this part of Australia, we have 85 different bioregions. And my thoughts behind developing it here is if we can set up best practice approaches in all of those bioregions, we can demonstrate that to other similar regions around the globe. So I think this is why it's good to be based here. Um, now, another reason as to why it's really good to be in Southwest Western Australia is it is one of the recognized uh, biodiversity hotspots. Um, there are, only, I think there is only one international bio, internationally recognized biodiversity hotspots in Australia and it is here. And this is where we are doing our work. <clears throat> so, I'm just going to go now through the development of the collection of the baseline data and how we use it for management plans. So the work we're doing is has been done and we've done this now, I think in probably 25 different uh, reserves, all urban and peri-urban, uh, uh, the area of city of Mandurah and Perth. So these are the two different locations in which we've been conducting our work. 
So the first I'm going to show you now is with the city of Mandurah, which is surrounded by Ramsar wetlands. Um, and here, this is just the particular, one of the particular areas where we're working on a management plan. Uh, and the management plan is how do we manage and restore these landscapes to ensure they are biodiverse. And that's just a, a photo of one of the areas. So let's show you how we do our field collection. Now this is, um, right, we are using an application. Now what you see in front of you at the top here is just, you can see the top of the application and we've done some data collection and this is how it looks. This is a reserve, um, a very large reserve, which sits around the edge of a, um, an estuary in a Ramsar estuary. So that's the, the, how it looked, the screen of the application. So when we, I'm just showing you now here somewhere where I have been collecting the data and started to collect the data. So our aim is across this reserve that we are going to set up these different weed cover values. A lot of walking, a lot of looking at ecosystems and a lot of looking at biodiversity. So the idea is that um, initially, if we found an area, and I've put four polygon dots here just randomly, just to show you how it works. So we found this area, um, it, it, it is of consistency in that it's by weed cover. So the dot, the polygons have gone down. Once the polygons have gone down and we tick this here, this is um, the, the wizard form that we will go through. So the next thing that shows is the date. Um, so we know exactly the time and date we're collecting the data. Now here we have to determine the weed cover value within that polygon. So in this particular case, I've selected 81 to 100% weed cover. Now we want to know about the vegetation condition. You can't see all my choices of condition here. I've just put a couple there so you can see. We really need to know about condition as well as many other things. So we will select that. Then we move on to the next part of the form. This is our disturbance form. So there's lots, excuse me, there are a number of different things to do with firm, uh, disturbance for this area or that particular polygon and we can tick that. Then we have a list of all the native species. Um, now, for within the city of Mandurah, they have 50 kilometers of coastline and huge areas of reserves. Much of it is peri-urban and outside urban areas. So we've been, as we've been building this ap application, we are adding the into the list all the different native species across the, all the reserves. So this, what you see in front of you is a list um, that we can scale down that list. There's 350 native species there, um, which we've been gathering and adding to each time we do more reserves. Um, and we go down the list and select those particular native species, which are within that polygon that we've identified. The next one is a list of weed species. So once again, we go down the list and tick all the weed species within that polygon. Fire, um, as in many other places, is, is uh, serious here and um, we don't want too much fire, although there is a lot of controversy over frequency of fire. But we like to just record within each polygon, what is the uh, fire? Is it recent, historical, repeated? And there's uh, three or four other selections there, which we choose. Uh, we're also interested in feral fauna and other fauna. So once again, we have a drop down menu where we tick those fauna. And then at the end, any notes we might want to make um, about that reserve. Once we've done that last one, which is our last drop down menu, we then end that and the polygon, which you saw at the beginning, then is colored by the weed cover value. So at the beginning of that, I selected it as an 80 to 100% weed cover. So on the left of this screen, you can see this is um, a field collection data in progress. And you can see that we've been building up all of those walking, all of those little red lines are uh, walking, uh, a lot of walking just to work out where we're going to lay down the um, uh, weed cover values and the polygons. So now that we've done that, the next thing, this is how that particular reserve ended up. Um, so what we need to do now is work out how we're going to use this data uh, for management, restoration, how we're going, we can using this for selection of where we're going to import, import our restoration, where we're going to do it, why we're going to do it there. And then there's a lot of other data as to why we choose these places. So the data that's collected 
reflected in that application, which is called MAPT, M-A-P-P-T, is then sent straight from MAP back to um, wherever the G uh, GIS system is being held. So in this case, that's uh, just a bit of a, an overview of that reserve. You can see it has a very high overstory, but when we're measuring the weed cover, we're specifically looking at the ground cover. So of course you can't do this from uh, any sort of drone or other photography uh, because you cannot see underneath. So this is how that um, data from the application looks when it's sent back to the GIS system. It arrives with all the polygons and then we just, um, just quickly put uh, the colours in, etc. And so this is now what you see now is what we are looking at in the GIS system. We know exactly that and we have a very significant attribute table of biodiversity for every one of these polygons with all the data that was collected, uh, which I just showed you recently, as re re previously. Now, the next thing is we're talking now about management. So what happens, we want to manage. So we've just pulled out this one thing. So we've got the list of all of those species and we can just query in the GIS where that particular, any of those species are. And there's hundreds of species in that list. In this case, um, the Watsonia species is highly invasive. So we've just pulled out the location of Watsonia species. So the managers know immediately you know, we don't have to be wandering around, oh, where will we do this or where will we do that? They've got that data right there for them. If it's what's only they're choosing to manage, they know exactly where it is located around that reserve. <clears throat> now, another thing that comes back, sitting back in the um, attribute table in the GIS system is an awful lot of information. So when we collect that data, we know exactly that the area of every polygon. So this is just a let, to let you see a bit of the attribute table where we have the polygon number down the side and all the different factors that we collect along the way are all here um, and they're available for use and for the managers to really make use of uh, when they're deciding where they're going to work. Now, including in that um, data collection is we had a, a layer of a plant community. And this you can see, this is a reserve which I mapped um, oh, sometimes six or eight months ago, you can see how many different plant communities we identified. I think there's about 30 or 40, and you see them down the side. <laughs> and we work our plant community on the dominant overstory species. So not only do we know where the weeds are, but we know also know where all the native species are, every individual native species, but we know which plant community all of those species are sitting in. And I'll show you now how we use that information for our restoration. <clears throat> this is just an example here where we can see it's a, a polygon seven. Um, here it's the name of the plant community. It's an 80 to 100% weed cover, etc. So we use that data. <clears throat> so once we've got that data, and now in this situation here, in the bottom um, bottom left corner, you can see an area which is red, 80 to 100% weeds. It's sitting there amongst some really almost good condition. And we're figuring this is the area that we want to restore. We want to do some restoration in this area so that it doesn't spread. And this is the area that we would like to focus our restoration on. So what we do here is have a look at what the plant community is here at this red spot. Um, and we find somewhere else uh, within the reserve where we have that same plant community, but in a zero to 20 percent high, very good condition. So we go there, um, we, we working out what we're going to do at weed control, but if we want to do any planting of that for that restoration, we want to make sure we put exactly the right species that will work for that plant community. So we've gone back to our GIS system and found the same plant communities here. And <clears throat> we look in there and here you can see on the right, all the native species which are found in that same plant community. So from that, once we've done weed control and any other form of um, work which needs to occur as part of the restoration, we make sure that what any species which we may return to that area will match or come from this list of species. <clears throat> so that's just giving you a really, a very brief, but hopefully not too brief, overview of why it's important to collect this baseline data. It really gives us a huge amount of information to know that when we're doing our development of our management plan, we can do it with a really good evidence base. 
So here we go. Um, so from the GIS data, those who are the land managers have developed are developing management plans, and you can see they have a list of the management actions, the timing when they're going to happen, who's responsible for it, and just a whole list of the different actions they're going to take. Now these actions are decided and determined upon by that base from that baseline mapping. Um, here's just another part of the management plan and working out the different things that, and the timing of when the actions will occur across the year. This has all come from this original baseline mapping. Um, so I will just now take you to, um, well, this is just showing you this reserve. I, I, it's, it's really quite nice little video. Um, this is our Banksia woodland. This is what this Banksia area here is in Australia, it is listed as a threatened ecological community under our federal legislation. So any work, anything that does, happens here really does has to be very well managed um, because it is a pretty significant vegetation community. It was actually the vegetation community uh, in which I did my PhD also. So I do like this area. Thanks in Woodland very much. You can see it has a high canopy, canopy and these lower Banksia species. <clears throat> so we've got these management plans um, and we're doing a number of other management plans. And here's some examples. And unfortunately, I, I hit the button too quickly, but where you saw the dolphins and others, these were a lot of management plans along a very big river system. And we had all of the, um, the same mapping along that river system. And that river system flows into the uh, Ramsar listed site. So once we've developed, um, once the uh, land managers have developed the management plans, the implementation phase comes. So this is here now, we're going to, I'm just going to show you briefly how we look at and what we do and how we make use of that weed cover value during our management. Once again, this is another reserve um, against, uh, at the edge of another um, uh, Ramsar listed estuary. And uh, once again, it's that Banksia woodland and Chewett woodland. Um, so I'll just take you to the next slide. We have got a little video here. Um, here it is. Here you can see how significant it is and how very close it is to the edge of um, the, big, the estuary and why it is really significant that we look after these places and going back to our original um, overarching goal and key focus, working around waterways and estuaries. Uh, these places are all very close to human habitation as well. So um, here, so this now is underneath that uh, little drone video you just saw. So we did the weed cover mapping at the ground level. You can see how close um, people are living to this right on the border huge uh, worries about fire and other sorts of things. And here's that estuary I just showed you. So I'm just going to show you now this area here, um, which uh, had a weed mapping of eight. The whole reserve was very, very poor. A lot of weed, uh, high weed cover with some good condition in the middle, but an awful lot of work needs, needs to be done on this reserve for restoration. We're trying to get the whole area back to a very dark green or zero to 20% weed cover. So I'm just going to show you now this area where the arrow is um, and just some work that's been done here. So what I'm showing you now is when the, the managers or the, the field crew go into the reserve to do their field management, they use the same application, um, which records what they do. It's recording it also into that same polygon. So here's just one example. It's, um, it, it's who, who the person is, how many are in the work crew, and the name of the reserve, the date, etc., and what they are doing while they're there. They do this every single time they go into that reserve uh, and all members of the, the management team fill out these forms. So this area here, which I just, um, I've just showed you before was extremely red. So when the weed cover value was taken originally, um, a couple of years before this restoration, this whole area was completely covered in weeds. You can see now there's just a few left. These green ones here are still weeds, um, but this is the work that they're doing. So they're going and doing the weed control 
And while they're there, they're also recording any fauna. And once again, just showing you the area that they're working in. Um, and they're recording about weed species and how that weed, weeds are treated. <clears throat> and here's other information. So all of this information is recorded into that same polygon area um, for all the work that the field and the people on the ground are doing in their restoration activity. Now here I've um, just got a little video, I believe. No. So that, sorry, so what we've done now, that area, if we were to go there now and do another assessment of the weed cover value, we would probably say it is zero to 20 or 20 to 40% per cover, percent weed cover. But I'm going to explain how we use that shortly. Um, but what this has enabled this is what is really called smart management. <clears throat> uh, over time, and the examples that I've just given you with the city of Mandurah, we have what are called bush crews um, who are employed by the local government who go out and do the field work as I was just showing you in that last um, exercise. In the time they've been implementing this, the number of bush crews has gone up from two to three and it's, I think there's six people in each bush crew because the decision makers within those departments can see the effectiveness of what they're doing. They've actually got a quantitative measure of what they're doing. But we also measure the economics and I'm going to just move forward to that shortly. But it also gives a really good significant understanding of the way in which these uh, places are being restored. So now I'm just going to bring into this the um, economic side of it. We've shown you how we collect the data on the ecological side and how it moves into a GIS system and how we make use of it for our restoration. So here I'm going now to give you some more examples. This has been tested in, I think I'd probably say about 15 different um, ecosystem types. So we've really start, done a lot of work to really test it and work out how to do it. So here's a, an example, which was the very first place we did this, uh, coastal ecosystems back in Perth, um, the city. And it was, very, it was working with the local volunteers. It was actually them who came to me and they said, will you map 10 weeds along our coast so we know where they are? And I said, no, I won't, but I will map the whole coastline for every weed and every native species, and then we can work out what to do. So these are the people who are really the, the backbone of everything working behind the scenes here. So this is just some, just some photos. This is urban Perth. Um, you can see it's this, uh, buildings around, you can't see much of them, but this is the whole area now, it's a six and a half kilometres of coastline in which we have done this same sort of mapping. Different here, we don't have tree species, um, but we do have some very thick shrub species and it's the understory that we're trying to measure. <clears throat> this is just a set of maps um, across the whole coastline, which we developed um, for the whole region and the whole area. And what we did then, because that was started sooner, we've actually been able to then go back and remap that area for weed cover uh, after time, after some of the restoration work's been done, and also keep a record of the money that's been spent uh, during that restoration. <clears throat> it's critically important. Um, I've seen too much money wasted in restoration when it's not um, measured well, done well, and in this situation, really the reason to bring this economics in is we do not want our money wasted. It's hard enough to get. So we want to make sure that when we do it, we know what we're doing, which is what you've just seen, that baseline ecological measure. But we also want to know that from an economic perspective that what we're doing is really effective. Um, what we have found here also in this coastal region with a different local government, it has also brought more money into those restoration actions because the decision makers who may not necessarily understand biodiversity or understand restoration, but they do understand money. So we're trying to make sure that they can hear and understand this. So what I'm showing you here, <clears throat> this is that coastal reserve. So the colours in red, first of all, for this this graph here, this is zero to 20% weed cover, 20 to 40% weed cover, 40 to 60, up to the end, 80 to 100%. So in 2011, which you see in red, um, this is the amount um, of area, which was uh, zero to 20% weed cover. 
when we get to, and then in 2013, you can uh, see this has gone up. This is the 2013 remapping. We go back and we remap that weak cover value again in exactly the same polygon. We call, record other data as well. We can also work out which um, invasive species have, are no longer there or which new ones have come. And then by two, 2015, that weed cover area of zero to 20% weed, which in some cases had absolutely no weeds, has increased significantly. And this is just showing you the different other ones. I suppose go down here, the 80 to 100% weed cover in 2011, um, you know, there was quite a deal and now it's gone down. I'm sorry, I've hit this. <laughs> Here's the next slide, which actually shows it to you in a little bit more detail. What I'm showing you in this slide was a project we were doing on a small area, but we were keeping records quite quickly. So on the left side is the, um, the baseline measures of weed cover, red being um, weed cover 80 to 100% and getting coming down to the greens. We started, some, some money was got and the restoration started. So in 2014, at the beginning of the restoration, that has started to change. You can see that the, um, the weed cover, the 80 to 100% had gone down and the um, others had also um, changed significantly. So through that weed cover time and that weed, weed restoration time and the remapping of the weed cover, by the end, we had no zero, 80 to 100% weed cover left and the whole area had almost become zero to 20% weed cover. This is what people want to see. And it puts so much impetus into those people who are actually doing the weed control on the ground or the restoration. Um, so they actually feel really good about what they're doing. Now, what, I'm, what I've got here now is bringing this economic into it. So we collected all the money that was spent. Uh, we've divided up on weed control. Restoration is all sorts of things, um, including plants and other, other types of things which are required in restoration. You can see how much proportionately was spent on monitoring. Now, by monitoring, we're talking about this baseline monitoring. That's what we mean by monitoring and this uh, cost money, money. So this really shows people that to do this um, really doesn't cost a lot in proportion to your whole restoration project. Um, and the last one there is the average um, of all those uh, money, all that money. That money was put in by the, the land manager. <clears throat> What I've got here is just the community volunteers who also did a huge amount of work in this. A lot of hand weed control. There's real issues about chemicals. People don't want to use chemicals. Um, and we've also put in here uh, their volunteer hours. Um, much of that is also included as a dollar investment. And we have the total investment at the end. Once again, you can see that monitoring proportion of just going back and remeasuring the weed cover value in the same polygon was very small. So the next, um, making use of both that ecological change. So the ecological change is the change in weed cover value over time. And then we've got a formula that we've calculated and we put the money into that as well. And through that formula, we come up with a success indicator. Now, the lower that number, the greater the success. So you can see, um, there's a success indicator of 1.51. In that area, there has been a big change in weed cover, a, a hole from uh, five to one, zero, one. So there's been a big change in weed cover. In the one below that, um, which also has a success indicator of 1.51, the weed cover change has not been so great. On the left, you can see 3.01. So that's saying, hey, this particular area, and we know exactly which polygons it is, this is just a summary of it all, something has not worked so well. What is it? What did we do there? And you can go back and have a look and see what it was you did in that area and why it's not as successful um, from both an economic uh, and an ecological perspective. So here, I'm just wanting to show you this because this is the very early stuff we did along the coast. So on the right where you can see the red, this was the weed cover value the first time we mapped it in 2011. So that's probably in the, on the right of your screen or center of the screen. Those were the weed cover values. Um, 
Now there's red, there's yellow, yellow 40 to 60%, red 80 to 100%, zero to 20 in the middle. Now on the left, we went when we went back and did that remap in exactly the same polygons, you can see we really, there's only a tiny, tiny little piece of red um, in a small polygon at the bottom. Everything else is either zero to 20 or 20 to 40% weed cover. It has made a huge difference. And not only is it the weed cover that changed, but also the native species is changing. And in many of these cases, particularly along that roadway, which was very red, there are actually no weed species left and it is all have been restored to native species. So that's a little bit of a visual of what we mean about re-measuring the weed cover value. <clears throat> so once that coastal area and the land managers um, and the decision makers who make decisions about who's going to manage what and how, how much they're going to invest, <clears throat> They said, this is so effective, we are going, they, had, they then invested more money in further restoration along the coastline because they could see it would work. But they also said, we have this reserve which borders on the coastline. So you can see the coast there. That was the co part of the coastline we mapped. And also this is here me, we're hiding down in the corner there, walking around that 75 hectares of um, bushland, which, is, which borders on the coast, doing a similar approach across this whole area of bushlands, a lot of walking, a lot of um, uh, learning a lot about the ecosystems. A school sits in the middle of it. You can see the coast on one side, a school in the middle, people very urban, uh, very urban, but the bushland extends right down to the coast and also onto that coastal area. And here's a little bit more of that bushland of that 75 hectares. <clears throat> so I guess in summary, what we're finding, um, and really that city of Mange, which I showed you at the beginning, they are now adopting this completely across everything they do. They've completely changed the whole processes and they've integrated it across all the different departments um, who have anything to do with um, natural area reserves. So really what this is really showing, the evidence base, um, Having that evidence base, that baseline evidence base, allows all sorts of forms of adaptive management. Having a really strong biodiversity database is incredibly useful for all sorts of reasons, not just for what we've seen here today, but for many, many other reasons. You actually can see what you're doing, what you've got, and how you're improving your biodiversity. Um, it has been proven now that it will increase the number of resources and it also is highly effective in incorporating the people and others around there in becoming involved with this work. So this is our, just a little artistic representation of some of the reserves we've done. Um, uh, the one very red at the bottom was the one I gave you as an example. Um, you can see the curly one in the middle, that was the one along the river. The one on the left is the coast and there are many others there as well. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much and acknowledge so many people have been involved in this. Many, many volunteers, uh, many working within our government departments and many working um, in many other aspects of the development of this project. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Judy, for the excellent presentation. We've had quite a few questions about the specific methods you've used and other aspects of the program. And I want to start with a really basic one that came in right at the top of your presentation from uh, Tim Lewis. And he asked, how are you defining a weed? Oh, look, we could, this is a, it can be political, this thing called invasive species. I live in a biodiversity hotspot. When we, in a biodiversity hotspot, anything which is not a native species, uh, a plant which is not a native species is a weed. Now, if you were perhaps, perhaps in Europe, um, a lot of species are considered part of that biodiversity. But here in Australia, any species which is not native to that um, environment is a weed. Um, and same for anifauna, um, invasive fauna as well. Anything which is not was not originally in Australia before we settled the country, um, yes, that would be called a weed. I hope that helps. I know there's a lot of different discussions on the topic, but we are sticking to, this is all about biodiversity. That's what we're trying to do 
is restore really healthy biodiversity because we know that will be really resilient to any change that comes along, including climate and other disturbances. Thank you. Great, thanks. So there are a couple questions about the specific applications um, you yes. use. Sandra has asked, uh, well, great presentation. I'm interested in the software that was used. How may I access it? And Charles Shore asked, what type of GIS do you use? Is it web enabled? Uh, yes, so uh, the software is called Mapped. Um, I can send uh, something about this to Cara or Brock later, if you like. M-A-P-P-T. Um, it is a, a, a software which you can collect any sorts of data in. We have actually brought in all those different drop-down menus. We have modified the menus to suit exactly what we do want to collect. Um, if we're different reserves, some of those, I showed you some of those drop-down menus at the beginning when we were collecting the data. We're using it on a tablet, um, Android. It's hasn't been as oh you can also use it on a mobile phone but that's a bit tricky because it's hard to see now from that tablet um, we can then send actually share the data from the tablet I've just got the tablet here in front of me we can share the data directly from the tablet uh, won't be a minute so this is just the tablet that I used to collect the data. It's not showing you quite what I was showing you then, but that's the tablet. We can share that, all that data sits on the tablet and we share at the end of your day in the field, you share directly from the tablet straight back to wherever you're, just by email, back to wherever you're keeping your GIS system. So in this case, the GIS system is kept by the land manager. So the one where I was showing you all the work with the GIS, that is just a free form. It's called QGIS, which is freely available. I presume it's freely available around the globe. Um, and that's what the land managers are using. So they are using that. Um, I think the question was, is it web-based? Yes. Um, it's just like ArcGIS, actually. It's not much different to ArcGIS. Um, in fact, it's probably easier to use, I think. Um, so hopefully that has answered your question. Yeah. Great, thank you. And then a couple of specific methodological questions. Um, Josh is asking, how are the polygons delineated and the yes. cover classes assessed in the field, transects, plots, visual, qualitative? Yes. No, so they're, they're not transects, they're not plots, which is, this is why this is so different because people tend to sit up quadrats or, or transects. We have, we map the whole reserve. So how are they assessed? Um, they are assessed on what you are seeing on the ground as you walk around. So if I'm seeing an area um, which in our very biodiverse reserves, and you did see some photographs from the above, very, very rich in different, in many different plant species. So if I'm in an area and I'm walking around there, and for instance, we don't have grasses here, so I'll pick invasive, an invasive grass. If there's an area that is really dominated by the invasive grass, I will walk around the bound, or anyone who does, walks around the boundary of that extremely grassy area. As you're walking, your walking track is being recorded on the application, um, and you've decided this is just all weeds. So it's going to be 80 to 100% weeds. So you put the dots where you want the polygon to go. When I give an example there, I was just making a pretty well rectangle. But you put the um, polygon, as you make the polygon, you put them around that area where you probably walked um, because you know it's 80 to 100%. You put the, dot, the polygon dots around, you tick this is where you want them to be. And then after that, all the information that you record onto those drop down menus all relates specifically to that polygon you have made. It's very different. It's not quadrat based, it's not transect based. It's actually what we're calling an ecosystem approach to restoration, an ecosystem approach to invasive species management as well. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so here's more on field methods, and then we'll move, some of you have asked more conceptual questions, and we'll move into those. Um, these are both about the data collection process, so I'll bin them together even though they're separate. 
but um, Crystal Crown has asked, when collecting weed cover data in the field, how do data collectors determine the boundaries of the polygons they're entering into the system? I think you actually just an answered that. Yeah. Yes, I um, think that's it. It's a visual yeah. thing. It's, yep. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to Caitlin is asking, is there any citizen science applications using this vegetation form wizard? Do assessors need training credentials to complete an assessment? Um, no, uh, a citizen science, or people could do this themselves. Um, you just need to give them a little bit of training in that. Uh, we're working on that now with uh, the one, the group I said, the City of Manager, who've really taken this across the whole of their um, department. Uh, we are now going to start doing workshops now that we've got it really well established with um, anybody who locally lives in these areas. You could see that a lot of people live closely. It's urban, very urban. And we will train people in how to do that. Uh, you know, the, the very baseline, the very first measure, it's important to get that right. But when you go back after you've done some restoration, and you'd like to measure um, the, the weed cover value over time, this can be done really easily by other people as well. So getting people involved is a really key part of this. That was the whole overarching goal and of our um, IUCN CEM thematic group um, was it's about working with local communities. And I did give you a quick example of that. So yes, it can easily be um, worked with citizen science or local people who may have an interest in this. It also helps actually people who are living or wherever they are around these areas to become more involved in it and that and to actually care more about the landscapes in which um, the work's going on. I hope that answered your question. I don't know if it did directly, but. No, no, I think that was great. Um, all right, so um, Josh had a second question uh, where he was thinking about the cover classes versus continuous cover estimation yep. um, and the loss of information, say, you know, a situation where it was 79% versus 81% oh. and also oh. the zero to 20 in particular. And any uh, comments on that? Uh, yes, I mean, it has to be usable. Um, and with it, and, and the, the, the question you're asking here is, you, you know, you just have, we found, we did a lot, of, I did a lot of research before I started and found that five classes was the really best way to be able to measure change over time as well. Where, you know, that's what this is about. It's about measuring change over time. The five classes were the ones that really did seem, going any more than five did not seem practical. I mean, if you wanted to do, become even more more strict within that you could you could make the classes smaller you could have zero to ten ten to twenty etc and have ten classes just for these ecosystems and for the purpose that it's being developed in terms of managing change over time and incorporating all that data about all the native species all the weed species and all the other drop down menus we had um, if you were to do that in 10 classes, I don't think you'd ever get it finished, to be honest with you. Um, so it's got to be usable, but certainly you could, you could make 10 classes or, or whatever, you know, so you get your 75 to 80 if you choose to. Um, the reason we chose weed cover, because when we're doing restorations in these reserves, that's the thing that changes most quickly. The native cover doesn't change much really. It's slow growing where we are here in um, urban in southwest WA. But the thing that does in tropical regions, that's different. But the thing that changes most quickly for measuring change will be your wheat covers. <clears throat> so I hope that answer. I mean, you can do as many classes as you like, but I hope you've got time to do it. <clears throat> so there's still a few more methodological questions. Apologies if I didn't get to yours, but you could send an email to me and I'll forward it on to Judy if you want to ask yes. additional questions. I wanna move into some more of these sort of conceptual questions and Shabdendu has asked two. Um, first, he says it would be great if you can explain some of the major challenges, issues faced during the entire exercise. And then a second question about the intangible costs associated with this kind of restoration work. Um. Challenges, um, I, I suspect the main challenge could be plant ID. 
um, as we've been going, uh, having the knowledge to identify all the species. Um, I've done this many, many times now um, with many different approaches. And I think the biggest challenge really is having um, the knowledge of all the different plant species and being able to identify them quickly. Um, I haven't found many other challenges and, and a lot of the local government people are starting to pick up and do it themselves as well. They're finding it easy. And I think part of setting this up like this was also to make it quite easy to do. So, um, sorry, Carol, was the question about challenges in collecting the data? Was that what the Look, question was? Generally, challenges. challenges. Um, in data in any aspect of the program. Well, what I would say is the biggest challenge in restoration in this landscape is people wasting money on doing a little bit of weed control here and there and a little bit of weed control somewhere else um, and maybe putting a few plants in the ground and forgetting about it. So that to me is, is the biggest restoration challenge. So the development of this was to overcome those restoration challenges and those weed control challenges so we can measure it. And anybody, whether you're talking to a CEO of an organisation who doesn't even know what the word weed or restoration is, or whether you're talking to the local community, this is really designed to get everybody on board, to get everybody to understand. So I actually think this has overcome a lot of challenges because you have that baseline information. Now, um, intangible costs. Um, can you give me an example, perhaps, of what might be meant by intangible costs? I have nothing other than what was listed in the question. Yeah. Um, that's, that's okay. We can... I think, I think I, I, I'll tell you what. Yes, so thank you. What I would have liked to have done, but it's, a lot of this has been done in a voluntary capacity, developing it and evolving it. But what really needs to come in this, which is at the moment intangible, is the social benefits. The social mm -hmm. benefits that are coming from this, at the moment, they're intangible. They don't need to remain that way. This has been an evolution and development of something. But the, and I've talked many times, I saw, showed you a picture of some of the volunteers there. It's, it's having this data and this measurement and just the visual measurement for them. They don't need all the biodiversity measurements. That's the thing that keeps them going back two or three times a week voluntarily, just taking out more weeds. They want to see by the next time someone measures, there's no weeds left. There's not a weed there. You know, that, so that's intangible. I think the social benefits at this stage are quite intangible, um, but we could develop this further so we could measure those as well. Thank you. So we're right on the hour, but there's a few more questions I yeah, want to get to. So. Yeah. Judy, if you're okay, we'll continue on. And for those of you who've participated, if you need to drop off, please do so. We hope we'll see you next month. I put in the chat information about accessing videos from the full webinar series. You can do that through our YouTube channel or through the CEM webpage. In addition, there's information about becoming a member of CEM. And next month, our theme will be forest restoration with Himlal Baral. So Judy, um, Becca was kind of thinking in line with you with your um, last response and she asking, how do you safeguard all of this investment you've made to make sure land use changes in the future don't antagonize uh, your achievements? I think so. Um, yes, I think so. Because many of these areas we're working in, for instance, I gave you an example of I said, this is what's called a threatened ecological community. Um, so a lot of this work is being done in reserves that are protected. So from that side, it's tangible. It's, um, it's protected in that the developer can't come along. So we don't do this in areas where a developer might come through and bowl the landscape over, which is happening at alarming paces. So we ask being selective about doing it in places we know will remain as in that particular way. Uh, the other thing about long-term benefit, because we're measuring it so well, it's what I mentioned, I think a little bit earlier, where people might just do a bit of weed control, a bit of restoration and for a year or two and forget about it, you go away and it's, it's not long enough and it, it just doesn't succeed. Because it's so measurable, because it's incorporated into the, the management systems and the, all the management people, 
are those who manage on the ground, those who make decisions above the management level, those up to the CEO and all those different layers. And because it's incorporated into the, manage, the land manager's geographic information system, it is there to be used for so many reasons that I think it will stay, it, we will not lose it. And this, was a, this is another question. Staff will move and people will change, but we are, we are, I'm at the moment writing this up as an IUCN, CEM, Ecosystems and Invasive Species um, case study of best practice to distribute globally. Um, I, gave, I understand the Australian government is also quite interested in taking this up um, because in Australia, we do a lot of weed, weed control and invasive species work. So mm -hmm. in that perspective, I think once we get this written up and distributed globally for anyone who wants to use it, outlining the methodology, that also maintains its long longevity as an approach, I think. Excellent. There's three final questions that are really open-ended. So um, I'm curious to hear your response to each, each of these. And Judy, again, thank you so much for being willing to be up in the middle of the night so here's um, for some, some thought-provoking responses. Um, Seamus says, I really appreciate your coverage of the technology and data-driven approach, among other things. As we try to both expand the restoration movement and push towards a broader, more integrated relationship with the natural world, here's the question, how can we make monitoring a more central and approachable part? I have found monitoring to include critical scouting and observing, and also it's crucial to build a relationship and sense of place for practitioners. Thank you. Um, I think if, I know I pushed the button and my, <laughs> and my slide moved too quickly, but on the couple there with the, um, where I had the, the money, you could see the monitoring dollars um, was a very small graph, a very, very small percentage of the whole thing. And I think that's how we make this monitoring side critical. We have to sell it. It's like any of this. You, how do you keep biodiversity? How do you do rest? Why do you do it? How do you do it? We have to sell it to those who wouldn't normally do it. And that's the perspective, I guess, that I've taken with this. So we can actually show to people, look, the monitoring side in this was almost minimal compared to the total costs and the benefits which you get from that monitoring far outweighs the not doing it. So I think I think that mon the monitoring is critical. It's the only way we do know if we're succeeding or not. And in this case, or not is critical as well. Also, another thing when we've been back and re-measured the whole area, we've measured places where we haven't actually done any restoration. And it's shown the land managers that some places are going backwards. And that has also alerted the land managers, hey, we're putting our money in the wrong places. We're putting it in place ABC, but in place D, E and F, because they've got this baseline, they suddenly see it's going rapidly backwards and it's not an area that they thought they'd manage or put any money into. So I think it's about persuasion, but it's about having really good discussions and arguments, or not arguments, good discussions and really showing the benefits. Hey, your money is really doing this, this and this. So yes, your question about monitoring, if I've answered it in the way you are wanting me to, it's critical. There's no, I don't even think there's a point doing any restoration project without a baseline measure now. That's how I feel about that. So yes, please promote whoever you're talking to, to do monitoring. Yeah, so critical. Okay, we're going to go to a question about policy, and then we'll end with David Dow has a, a thought-provoking question about invasive weeds. So okay. um, Joe Tiermoy Shankar Deb, apologies for mispronunciation, is asking a policy question. Um, here's the comment first. The invasive species are creating massive problems both on land and in aquatic ecosystems. Most importantly, the freshwater communities are affected more than other habitats by invasive yes. species. In many cases, this threat is occurring by due to people themselves. And here's the question, what policies are there to stop this kind of practice? Developing countries are facing major threats from invasive species and losing biodiversity at local levels. What should be the solution? Uh, I, I think I made a comment at the beginning, a lot of focus over the last X years has all gone into islands 
at the detriment of all these places that you are talking about. Um, uh, I, I've been very strong on this topic of invasive species and saying many of us have been doing it wrongly for a long time. Your question is excellent. Now, regarding policy, the um, CBD post-2020 biodiversity framework, which will all the governments will be signing up to later this year, is going to have much stronger targets in it about invasive species. I'm following this carefully. I'm currently working in a consultancy capacity with all the ASEAN countries on this very topic. Um, they are all now starting to develop policy. And I think the reason they're all starting to develop that policy, which they will use, is because that IPBES Global Assessment has identified the fourth, I think the fourth or fifth biggest um, damage to biodiversity is coming from invasive species. That, that document is really changing the way people are managing this. So you have the post-biodiversity 2020 framework will have a much stronger um, policy and targets. Um, Asia, the ASEAN countries I'm currently working with are really starting to focus on this, but it's a huge issue. It's absolutely huge because it's been let go for so long. So the policies are coming. The in, IPBES invasive species assessment, when that is complete, it's, up, it's just had its second external review. Uh, it'll be complete and out for public comment. And I'm having play, putting a lot of input into that. Uh, forget timing, 18 months or so. It, it'll be a bit like the IPBES global assessment. It mm. will give direction to governments on what they should be doing. So I think we have to be patient. Just keep raising the profile of policy is critical. Okay, so here's one final question uh, for you from David Dow, uh, who lives in the Eastern United States. And, and he says, I have a power line right of way behind my house where herbicides are used for vegetation control. One of the consequences of this process is a diverse plant community of invasive species combined with native weeds. How does this increase in biodiversity fit within the topic of today's webinar? And I thought this was a chance to talk about invasion, invasive species and biodiversity because it is really confusing for people to sort out diversity and yeah. uh, weeds. Um, I, if I understood the first part of your question, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the questioner was asking, or, or was saying that the weeds are part of the diversity. Correct. Yeah. So where I'm talking about here, we are a really biodiverse place, one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. So it's easy for us to, to distinguish what is a weed and what is that na native biodiversity. Now, I don't know if the place where they are spraying your herbicide um, I mean, do people actually know what the native species are for that air, that place? If they do know that, then if I'm really the, the the way to make that landscape become resilient into the future is to really give it the species that belong there. And from my from the way I look at this topic, the species that belong there are those native species. I know the landscapes have changed, but the soils have changed, and a lot of things have changed. So I'm not quite sure, but I, I would suggest the best thing is if you can possibly distinguish between what is native to that place and what is a weed or a plant that's, a plant that's come in from somewhere else and really focus on removing the ones that have come in from somewhere else and replacing them, whether it's by planting or just by cont weed control, whether they'll come back naturally, but put those native plants back into that area I think it will recover more quickly, um, but I don't know the particular landscape. Herbicide is getting really, um, a lot of people are getting very upset about herbicide use. And there's a lot a big move here now where a lot of hand weeding is going on. It is actually, people are actually finding it to be more effective. When you understand about the soil seed bank and what's in the soil um, in terms of seeds and future populations of species, that also um, often hand weeding uh, can be far more effective and less detrimental to people's health. I don't know if that's quite answered your question, but please let me know, Cara, if it hasn't. 
Yeah, great response. Thank okay. you so much for your presentation, all your Thank thoughtful you. responses. We'll share the chat with you so you can see people's yeah. congratulations and other comments and ideas. Thank and thanks to all of you for participating in this month's webinar series. Next month, the topic is forest restoration. May will be innovative finance for restoration. So stay safe and we will see you all, we hope, um, for our April webinar session. Thanks to you, Judy. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.